Welcome to GabFest Reads for February 2024. I'm David Plotz, one of the hosts of the Slate Political GabFest. Kylie Reed's new novel, Come and Get It, is a funny, sneakily tense story of a college dorm at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. A residential advisor and a college senior named Millie Cousins strikes up a friendship. I use that term in quotes. A friendship with a visiting professor, Agatha Paul, who wants to eavesdrop on students in the dorm for an ethically dubious research project that she's working on. Come and Get It explores what happens when Millie and Agatha and the students in the dorm, notably two young women who are sweet mates, Kennedy and Tyler, or Tyler, start interacting and spying on each other and pranking each other and fantasizing about each other, and above all, using money and the threat of money to warp how they interact. Come and Get It uh, confirms what Kylie's glorious best-selling first novel, Such a Fun Age, suggested, which is that she has the best ear for actual human speech of any American writer. So, Kylie, welcome to GapFest Reads. Thank you very, very much. I'm excited to chat. I want to put you right to work. So will you read us a short passage to give us a feel for for how Come and Get It sounds and and how your writing sounds when you hear people talking? I'm going to read from what I believe is chapter two or three, and this is R.A. Move-In Day, and this, these are two R.A.'s just talking. Millie laughed through her nose. Was Joni in Southgate with you? No, she wasn't, thank God, Colette said. But we both worked at Clubhouse Fitness last summer, and she was annoying for obvious reasons. But then, okay, so when the minimum wage changed from 8 to 8.50, I made this presentation on how I should be getting 9.50 because I was killing it over there. I got like four old people to start taking Pilates, probably added years to their lives, and they loved me, but whatever. Anyway, the management ate it up. They were like, ooh, PowerPoint, look at this initiative. And they gave me 9.16 an hour, which was dumb, but I was like, fine. But then Joni was like, how is that fair? I've worked here longer than you, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, you've worked here for like four months longer, but if you want a raise and go ask, loser. And she was like, that's not the point. That's disrespectful. At this, Colette looked up. With the Sharpie in hand, she did that quick, listless motion for someone jerking off. And she was just a huge dick to me all summer. She'd be like, hey, Colette, the spot, water needs ice. Like, ooh, cool, thanks for telling me. Millie smiled. That's really dumb, she said. I know, she's such a pill. She also got pissed because this one time, I don't even remember what I said, but I had always assumed she was gay because Colette lifted her shoulders. Like, fucking duh. And I said something about it, and she was like, what? Why would you say that? And I was like, whoa, my bad, but I'm gay, so chill out. But yeah, when I saw her name on the dorm list, I was like, wow, I'm going to jail this year. But then I asked Amy who I was paired with, and I was like, okay, fine, she seems normal. At this, Millie experienced what she knew was a surplus of flattery and what it felt like an adolescent intrigue at learning that Colette was gay. In order to not draw attention to Colette's gayness, something she hadn't considered one way or the other, Millie picked up another sheet of cards. I'll stop there. That's so great. Uh, all right, this novel is titled Come and Get It. Get what? The three characters here are coming to get three very different things. Agatha is a visiting professor, and she wants to get over a relationship. Millie, our protagonist, wants to be an adult. She wants to get a house and a job and security. And Kennedy is a transfer student, and she's looking to start over. So you're in Ann Arbor. But this novel is very, very much set in Fayetteville which is a, a town, a city you lived in for a year, I think, from reading about you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the town is very much a character in the book. What about the University of Arkansas and its students and a dorm did you think was, that's going to make a great book? Why there? Why a dorm there? Why those students? There were a few things. I knew I wanted to write about young people and money and the Setting of a dorm seems like a hot house to explore how students navigate money and think about money all while they're living in these little boxes right next to each other. I think colleges are really interesting because for most Americans, if you go to college, it's a strange walkable utopia that you're living in for four years. You have all this leisure time. You can change your major and go join an improv group and see your friends down the street and just walk to a grocery store. It's fantastic, but it's also kind of 
like a mall and that it's this superficial promise of a future wherever you go. And very quickly, when you lift up the edges, you see that everyone is coming in from very different socioeconomic backgrounds and is dealing with different competitions within their own families and and where they can go as a person. So I was really intrigued to focus on a dorm because that's where you're learning how to be an adult for the first time in many cases, and you're by yourself and learning if you're gross or weird or not. So that was really intriguing to me. Um, And lastly, I was teaching at the University of Iowa when I started writing this and my students would say things that were so strange and bright and funny. And I wanted to uh, keep their voices in my head for a little bit longer. Let's stick on that because I do think what makes your writing so singular and so distinctive is that you have an incredible ear and I'm envious of it as someone who's been a writer for some of my life and never had an ear like that. How do you listen? How, how do you create these voices in your head? It's a bit of a game because I'm, as I'm sure that you've done, if you've transcribed anything because you've recorded something, you very quickly realize that we do not speak chronologically. We go off on tangents. We say, um, and like, and oh my gosh. And there's a lot of things that we're doing in between the things that we're actually trying to say. So while I'm writing, getting hyper-realistic dialogue is really important to me, but it becomes a game of doing three things. And one, it's showing characters for the majority of the book at the top of their intelligence, showing their best selves of what they think is their best self. And number two, it's making sure that their best self still isn't grading to a reader. When I'm doing interviews with students and getting inspiration, they may say like or um in the thousands. And so I want to include some of those likes or ums, but I also don't want to make fun of those students. This wasn't a satire this time around, but I want to make it true. So there's a lot of give and take there. I also think just being a writer, you need to put yourself in the position of being a listener and writing down something exactly the way you heard it. That's the kind of things that I like to read. Why did they have to be at the top of their game? Why is that important? I think it's important to be a democratic and generous writer. Otherwise, you look like you're making fun of your characters. And I think every character can be interesting depending on the different light that they're in. And I'm just not really super interested in fiction that says, look at these dumb kids, (laughs) especially because they're not dumb. I want to see them at their best. And then later when they make mistakes, those mistakes hit a little bit harder. I guess I also think feel like there's a conjuring act here because as you said, you wrote, I guess you wrote it in Iowa or maybe you thought about it in Iowa. You have lived in Philly. You've lived in Ann Arbor since you were in Fayetteville, but you're conjuring up people who are just mostly Southern certainly are the kind of students who would be at University of Arkansas at Fayetteville. How, how do you get back to them when you're not with them? I do a lot of interviews when I'm writing. And this time around, I had a research assistant and that was incredibly useful. So I interviewed probably formal interviews, about 30 people, and then maybe 20 others on top of that, of just making sure I was getting things absolutely right. So I interviewed some old students, some of my friends' students, people who went to Arkansas, people from Chicago, baton twirlers. I interviewed a number of people. And people always ask me, how do you get people to tell you things? I'm sure you know people just like talking about themselves. (laughs) And people were very gracious to me, and I'm really thankful for that. This episode of The Gap Fest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos. But it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. This episode of the GapFest is sponsored by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia and identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, 
and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations so you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real world results. That's SAP Business AI. John Stewart is back in the host chair at The Daily Show, which means he's also back in our ears on The Daily Show Ears Edition podcast. The Daily Show podcast has everything you need to stay on top of today's news and pop culture. You get hilarious satirical takes on entertainment, politics, sports, and more from John and the team of correspondents and contributors. The podcast also has content you can't get anywhere else, like extended interviews and a roundup of the weekly headlines. Listen to The Daily Show, Ears Edition, wherever you get your podcasts. Come and Get It is a lot, a book about money, and money is everywhere in it. People are constantly kind of slipping each other $20 bills for favors. Millie is counting pennies and dollars to save her house. Agatha is chronicling the financial lives of college students. And one of the things I really liked about Come and Get It, and such a fun age, too, was that both books recognize that for most people, most of the time, money is something they constantly think about. Do you think that relationships can be transactional and humane? Like a lot of the relationships in Come and Get It are transactional relationships, but they also have emotional valence and humanity to them. I do think that, oh, do I? <laughs> I'm not sure that transactional relationships within a class society can be 100% humane. I feel that when an exchange is happening, there's always going to be an imbalance of power. I mean, it's the same way as if you became really good friends with your boss, there are still things that you would not tell them because you want to keep your job. And so there's always going to be this layer in between you and that person. Um, I do think that when it comes to transactions, it's Money is a huge part of this novel, but there are other things being bartered. I think that one of the characters bartering her youth and her beauty. Um, one of the truly working class characters in this novel is Tyler or Toller, as she says at moments. And she does not come from a wealthy family, but she has a cultural cachet that she knows how to use and she wields that power very well. So I'm not sure if I know that transactional relationships can truly be humane in the society we live in. I think that we can try. <laughs> and some, sometimes we get there a little bit, but not completely. Sometimes the, the, the relationships in Come and Get It get screwy because there's a, there's money in it, but it's almost, but no one ever talks about what the money means. Like the money's part of it, but then they don't talk about what the money is actually signifying. Do you think people need to talk directly about money more than they do? I don't feel like talking about the money would create greater equality. I think if people had more money than they have, <laughs> that might solve things a little bit. In doing interviews with different people, I found that money is something that everyone wants to make sure that I know they think it's gauche to talk about, but they're super interested in it as well. And I think that that's a reflection of people feeling guilty for how much they have when others have not. But I know I think money works a little bit the same way that language does. And it only has power if that person doesn't have it. And so if someone made fun of me for, you know, um, I don't know, if someone said, like, I think a lot of people said that someone said the N word to me, that would be hurtful from someone I knew because that would be a barrier of trust that was broken. But if it was a stranger, I would say that person has issues. They probably have mental illness. That's that's nothing really at all. That doesn't really touch me. I think that money works the same way. And I think that talking about it, especially like if you have it, I'm not sure if that really does anything. But I think if something that someone's coming from a place of having money, they get to have more power. In such a fun age, Amira would make completely different decisions if she had health care and money. She wouldn't let people stop step all over her, but she's put in that position because she doesn't have any power. So I'm not the biggest fan of start the conversation <laughs> as much, which was something that came across a lot when Such a Fun Age came out. Um, I think real action is people having more money to to have something to back it up with. As in, as in Such a Fun Age, the, the central relationship of Come and Get It is between a young, morally centered woman trying to figure out how to be an adult and in her complex uh 
relationship with an ethically compromised older richer white woman so that relationship you've now done two versions of that what is that what about that kind of relationship intrigues you why'd you come back to that i'm super fascinated by uh morally and ethically ambiguous situations that would not put anyone in jail (laughs) Things that you say, oh, that's not really something you should do, but you can't really um, do anything to them because they're they're doing a certain thing. Where Millie and Agatha differ from Amira and Alex is that there's a bit of an attraction. Um, Millie is really intrigued by who Agatha is, how she talks, what she looks like. And Agatha wears a lot of money on her person in the simplicity and minimalist style that she has. And Millie is really attracted to that. Millie is completely ambitious in a way that Amira is not. And I think that that dictates a lot of her relationship with Agatha as well. Yeah. So you do something pretty remarkable and come and get it about college. So I have one college student, one uh, kid who just graduated from college. So I pay attention to what college life is like a little bit. And I think the book very affectionately and precisely depicts the rituals and small gestures of college life, the the niceties of a dorm, the decorations on the door. You go do a lot about decorations, the health and safety checks. Um, but you also make it all very sinister and tense uh, and ominous. Um, what is What to you is ominous about that life in, in college? Well, first of all, I'm glad you felt that way. Um, I love a low-level dread within a novel, so that's definitely something that I aspire to. This might sound strange. Yeah, you're like, what's going to happen at the bed? Yeah. <laughs> the health and safety check. What is going to happen? <laughs> oh, no. God. Yeah. There's something about people's stuff that is terrifying. I don't know when this started for me. Perhaps it was when I read The Road. Did you ever read The Road by Cormac McCarthy? Did I ever yeah. read it? I'm yeah. a father of a son. I read it. I will never pick it up again. It was most emotionally grueling experience I've ever had as a reader in my life. 100%. I'm not even a dad. And I was like, this this rocked me to my core. And there was something about when they were walking around, uncovering things, not knowing what was in people's spaces where they lived that I think I've carried with me as a writer. I've carried that fear of, of, of people's stuff in their homes. Um, the dorm is a place where people are figuring out who they are and trying on different personalities. And there's something that I think is horrifying that you can just buy as much stuff as you want and seriously hurt your person by filling up your dorm with things that do not matter. Um, Kennedy doesn't think that she has a relationship to money, but she is deeply connected to the joy of buying a new thing and the promise that, that it gives you. Um, I'm a bit terrified by our ability to gather so much stuff. So that was contributing to the low level dread. When I was, moving out of a house I'd lived in for 20 years, I I was like, man, it doesn't, I don't really understand why there's literally a dumpster full of garbage in the house, which is looked like a clean house. And then you start to realize like every week you kind of, you bring in maybe five pounds worth of stuff and you take out maybe three pounds worth of stuff. And that means that there's a net gain every week of two pounds every week. And if you can flesh that out over years and years and years, suddenly you have infinite amounts of stuff that have piled up. It's pretty terrifying. A capitalism tells you, hey, if you want to be more organized, stronger, faster, have more friends, all you have to do is buy this thing. And it convinces you, you're just buying this one thing, but we're buying a lot of things. And this is a novel about buying things. Let's let's end actually on a couple other topics. So is there anybody you read uh, as you were getting this book together who who influenced this book and is is it in the you know uh inspired by any other writers this particular book this novel came together quite neatly in that the three main characters were inspired by three different books i read paying for the party how college maintains inequality which is a book by two sociologists um, Laura Hamilton and Elizabeth Armstrong. And they did a version of what Agatha does. They interviewed young women in a dorm for about five years and marked their pathways and careers. And I was really moved by the book. Their findings were really interesting. And I just loved the setup and thought that I would mess with it within this novel. Um, Millie's character was inspired by a book called Knocking the Hustle, The Turn Against Neoliberal Politics in Black Culture by Lester Spence. It's an incredible novel. 
It's almost poetic and talks about the philosophy of inevitability politics. It's really beautiful. Um, so that really inspired Millie's hustle and her strive to get more and more. And then I read Monoculture, How One Story is Changing Everything by F.S. Michaels. And that inspired Kennedy. She gets into what she calls the economic story, which is basically capitalism and how it infiltrates different parts of our lives. And she talks about how choice and all of the choices that we have are actually crippling us. And that was a huge inspiration for Kennedy. And then on the fiction side, I don't know if you've read uh, The Factory by Hiroko Oyamada. It's a tiny novel about a factory that employs people to do things like edit memos and then throw them in the trash. And a dark circle of birds hovers over the building. It's very real and surreal at the same time and just really beautiful. And then finally, uh, what have you read recently not to inspire this book that you've loved? Recently, what have I loved? I read This Other Eden by Paul Harding, who was one of my professors at the Iowa Writers Workshop. And it's beautiful. I cried twice, I think. And it's narrated by Edward Ballerini, who might be my new favorite Audible reader. Uh, what else have I read? I'm currently reading Ruman Alam's next novel, Entitlement. I'm only two chapters in, but he's always so good. Um, and I read The Wager, which is really not my bag <laughs> at all. The one about the, the 1700s ship and the wreckage. We did. I, I, yeah, David, I interviewed David oh, for no that way. on this on GAFS reads. Yeah. A few what months was ago. he like? Yeah, he's an old, he's an old friend of mine. So he's wonderful. He's a, he's just amazing. He's, he's an amazing, he's an amazing reporter and then just an extremely humane person. Uh, yeah. You can look, go back and listen to it. Uh, it's a, it's oh, a great I definitely book. Will. If someone told me like, yeah, if someone was like, oh, read about this book and how gross it is to be at sea, I would be like, that sounds terrible. I, but it was an amazing book, and it's narrated by Dion Graham, and yeah, it was great. Kylie Reed's novel is Come and Get It. It is out now, and you should go and get it. Kylie, thanks for joining us on Gapfest Reads. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for the February edition of GapFest Reads. Our producer is Shana Roth. Ben Richmond is Senior Director of Operations for Slate Podcast. Alicia Montgomery is a VP of Audio at Slate. We'll be back next month with another edition of GapFest Reads. Until then, John and Emily and I will be back in your feed on Thursday with a new episode of the Slate Political GapFest. Fest.